Hello, my name is Jorge Nuno Silva and I'll be sharing some ideas about perfection with you. Our context is ancient Egypt, that fantastic civilization. In particular, we are going to look into some details of the Rind Mathematical Papyrus, a beautiful document written by a scribe, Hames, that starts the text by describing it as an accurate rockening for inquiring into things and the knowledge of all things, mysteries and secrets. Well, from the papyrus, let's see how ancient Egypt's multiplied to integers. The method is surprising. Suppose you want to multiply 19 by 71. You build a table with 1 on the top of the left column and 71, the multiplier, on the top of the second column. And then you go on doubling this row of numbers and doubling again and doubling again and doubling again. And now you don't have to double anymore because twice 16 exceeds already the multiplicand, 19. So you finish your building of the table. Now you choose from the left column the numbers that add up to 19 and the corresponding numbers on the right column must add up to the right result. This is a fantastic method to multiply two numbers. There's no use of multiplication tables, and the Egyptians did not use multiplication tables. It just takes doubling. That's all you have to know. Using our skills, our mathematical skills, we can analyze what's going on here. This is equivalent to using the distributive law and the binary expansion of 19, then everything becomes obvious. <clears throat> Let's do another example with same numbers. Let's change the order and let's consider now the multiplicand 71 and multiplier 19. We do the same procedure. We build two columns with one on the left and the multiplier on the right and we double and double and double and double and double and double until we would exceed the multiplicand. So we can finish our process. We choose on the left column the numbers that add up to 71 and the addition of the corresponding numbers on the right column should give us the right result. It is it looks a little bit different, but it is exactly the same procedure, mathematically speaking. Well, this multiplication is already extremely interesting, but let me show you an example of a division. Suppose you want to divide 7 into 91. Well, the Egyptians knew that this operation is the inverse of multiplication. Uh, so they were actually looking for an x that multiplied by 7 gives us 91. Of course, they did not write any x, they didn't have any x, but this is the idea. Well, they know how to multiply, they know how a multiplication algorithm looks like, and so let's try x times 7 to produce 91. So we have, we need two columns, on top of the columns 1 on the left and the multiplier 7 on the right and we double, double, double until we produce 91 on the right column. But then, for the multiplication to be correct, the multiplicand must be given by adding the corresponding numbers on the left column. So this is a fantastic procedure. The division doesn't even show up as a different algorithm. It's exactly the same one as the one used for, to multiply numbers. Again, 
no multiplication tables, just doubling. If you compare this procedure with our long division algorithm, you see how smart and elegant uh, the Egyptians were, and we appreciate them. Well, let's see an example that is not so simple. 35 divided by 8. By the way, all my examples come from the Rind Mathematical Papyrus, so they are original. So when we do the same thing and look for an x that multiplied by 8 gives us 35, we put 8 and 1 and we double and double, but now we have a problem. We cannot double anymore because 64 would not be useful to get 35. However, we don't get 35 on the, on the right column. We need smaller numbers. So what the scribe does is it takes the first row and divides both numbers by 2. Well, on the right column we get 4, it's still too large, so we divide again by 2. two we obtain 2, which is useful. We still need 1, so we divide by 2 again. And now we get 35 on the right, and so our, our division is complete. And the quotient is actually 4 plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. For some reason that nobody understands very well, Egyptians knew fractions, they knew divisions, but they only used what we call today Egyptian fractions or unitary fractions, fractions with numerator 1. There probably are some mystical religious reasons for that, maybe even some practical ones. Nobody's sure about it. So this is the typical Egyptian fraction. They only use these fractions with only one exception, and the, the expressions could not even contain repetitions of the same unitary fraction. So, for instance, if they have to deal with three sevenths, they would prefer to write this rational number as the addition of three unitary fractions. Well, there are lots of ways of getting this, exp this expansion or an equivalent one. I'll describe one way of doing it. You take from three sevenths the largest unitary fraction that you can, and you get a result that theoretically can be proved to have a smaller uh, numerator than three sevenths, and then you do the same thing to 2 over 21. You subtract the largest unitary fraction that fits, and voila, you finished the process and you get an expansion for 3 sevenths. This is actually a method that goes by the name Fibonacci Sylvester because Fibonacci used it in the 13th century and Sylvester proved its validity in 19th century. Now, we saw in the algorithms that the doubling is important. So we have to find a way, a practical way, of doubling unitary fractions. And uh, the Egyptians knew they needed this a lot because the calculations showed up with fractions uh, very often. Of course, they knew that if the denominator is even, this is a trivial problem. But what about if n is odd? You have a division to perform, and uh, it's lots of work. He, he did that in several cases, but in the Rhin Mathematical Papyrus, there's a list to help. It's like a, multi a table to help in calculations, not a multiplication table, but a table of 2 over n for n odd from 3 to 101. This is the table written in our uh, common numerals. And this is a fantastic and mysterious table. How did the scribe get these results? And why these and not others? Well, one preoccupation we can spot immediately. The scribe liked 
a small number of fractions and not too large denominators. And that is because Egyptians really uh, cultivated harmony and beauty. And so they didn't want ugly expressions. So let's see, for instance, the first element of this table, two thirds. Two thirds he gets as one half plus one sixth. Now, it seems like he used the knowledge of this decomposition to get, for instance, 2 over 63, by noting that 63 is a multiple of 3. You just multiply 3 by 21 to get 63. And so you can plug in the value you obtained for 2 thirds and as an expansion of unitary fractions, and you multiply by 1 over 21, and you get a nice expansion for 2 over 63. Well, it looks like the scribe had some knowledge of this general rule. 2 over 3k is equal to 1 of 2k plus 1 of 6k, which is obvious from the expansion of 2 thirds. However, keep in mind that the Egyptians had no way of writing general rules. The only way of writing uh, to to pass an idea was to use examples, maybe rich examples, maybe examples that the students would read deeply and understand that they, they had embedded a method that would apply in other circumstances, but nevertheless, they must be numerical examples. Let's see another one that shows up in the, in the table. The scribe gets this expansion for 2 over 11. And then, when he expands 2 over 55, it looks like he did exactly the same procedure. 2 over 55 is 1 fifth of 2 over 11. He plugs in the value, and voila. He gets a nice expansion of 2 over 55 in just two unitary fractions. Again, there's a general rule. It, it was not used consistently throughout the table, but used in several cases. So we believe that the scribe had some knowledge of the generality of the method. And let's jump to the last element of the table, which is very interesting, as I will try to show you. This is the last element of the table, 2 over 101 expanded in an addition of four unitary fractions. Why is it the last? Is it an accident? Or is the scribe trying to tell us something? Well, it turns out that this expansion, if instead of 101, we put n, we get an expression that is universal. It's good for any n. So it looks like the scribe is telling us, well, from now on, from this number on, you just use this method if you don't know any other. This one will work for all the cases. Of course, it uses four fractions when in some particular examples that I have showed you, that he gets a fewer number of fractions. However, this is universal. It works for every denominator. And this is fantastic. So I don't believe it was an accident that it was the last one in the list. Let's see, why does it work? When you find the least common multiple of the denominators and you reduce the fraction on the right hand side, you get something like this. And of course, the numerator is twice six and the denominator is six. And why does that happen? Because 6 is equal to 1 plus 2 plus 3. That happen to be the proper divisors of 6. So you got it. 6 is a perfect number. And that's the reason why this works. This procedure works only with perfect numbers. So the next one would be 28, would be... Uh, an extremely large number of fractions, but it would work. 
and works only with perfect numbers. So the Egyptians were the first to use perfect numbers, and they use six here. And uh, maybe that's the reason Greeks studied perfect numbers later. Uh, actually, ancient Greeks knew of four perfect numbers. These numbers are really fascinating for several reasons. Uh, well, it has been said that God created the world in six days. He could have been faster if he so wanted, but he didn't want to be faster. He wanted six, because six is perfect. Well, are there infinitely many perfect numbers? Nobody knows. Is there any odd perfect number? Nobody knows neither. And these are the oldest unsolved problems in mathematics. And it is fascinating that they relate with mathematics that show up in ancient Egypt times. Euclid proved an expression for some particular even perfect numbers, and Euler proved later in the 18th century that it was actually a necessary and sufficient condition. And so today we know how to, <coughs> how to recognize even perfect numbers. They are associated with Mersenne primes, and so when you see in the news that a new Mersenne prime has been found, well, a new perfect number has been found. Now, nowadays we know 51 perfect numbers, and the largest is a monster, is an extremely large number, and uh, I wanted to share with you this beauty and mystery of the perfect numbers, so I thank you very much for your attention.